The Art of the Transpersonal Self Transformation as Aesthetic and Energetic Practice Published in 2009 at Atropos by Norbert Kopensteiner In 2009, Mr. Kopensteiner was the Program Coordinator at the MA for Peace Studies and Research and Publications Coordinator at the UNESCO Chair for Peace Studies Uh, both at the University of Innsbruck, Austria. Acknowledgements. One guiding thread of this book is relationality of human existence. The becoming of this work, just like the continued becoming of myself, is a plurality. It is the flowing together of different threads that form the nexus that is this book, that form the ever-shifting nexus that I call myself. My appreciation and profound thanks go to the supervisor of my doctoral dissertation, Professor Wolfgang Schirmacher, for the guidance he has given, a guidance which has made me grow, made me reach, or, in different words, fostered my becoming. Prof. Martina Kaller and Prof. Wolfgang Dietrich both both read the first drafts of what was to become this book. They have provided valuable critical feedback, but my gratefulness runs much deeper than that. For years of inspiration, I thank them both and Wolfgang Dietrich for providing so many of the key turnings for the following pages, the key tunings. The song may be mine, but the tuning fork to which the music is set has been provided by him. This work finally would never have seen the light of day without Josefina. Your critical reading, your support and love have provided the beacon on which to chart my course through this adventure, this challenge. Te quiero mucho. Page 9. Beginning of the introduction. Why write? The question that needs to be asked at the beginning of every written work, and indeed even more so at the beginning of a work of the size of a book, is why write? Closely followed by why write this particular piece of work with these means toward these ends? The answer, if there is to be one, can only be a personal answer, as the reasons for picking up a particular topic at a particular time in life are always personal and distinct. A book and any kind of written work furthermore always remains a snapshot, a take of a moment bound in pages, a picture or at best a painting of what actually is a flow of life, a flow of thoughts and practices in an ever-shifting field of becoming with possibly much less coherence and cohesion than this image of a bound work published under the name of an author would suggest. This flow of life, this continuous transformation, is, I believe, also quite unavoidable, quite unstoppable, and thus quite human. From one moment to the next, with each breath we take, we cease to be identical to ourselves, and in some perhaps infinitesimally small way, we become other than who we are. Sometimes those changes are not or only barely perceptible. It is only rarely that some event of great proportions causes us to change in fast forward, speeding up the process. And yet we change. Given those observations, one possible answer to the first question could be the work of writing a book can be seen as part of a work on oneself, part of a conscious attempt at a work of transformation. Not to escape what one is at the moment, not from some fearful rejection of the now towards some perceived perfection or paradise in the future, but in order to give this perpetual process of becoming a certain temporary shape, to try to fashion it in a certain style and direction, which always remain contingent. The movement that might occur perhaps could be perceived by oneself 
as a step towards the subjectively better. This subjectively better would simultaneously be the only standard of measurement in a world without feathers. Without a grand book of levers and no overall system of coordinates in which this movement could be inscribed and measured for its progress or direction. However, in a certain delusion sense, we might still become the cartographers of our own space, the cartographers of a twisted path on a map that is a constant work in progress and will need to be partially redrawn time and again. I would thus like to answer these first two questions not quite coincidentally, with some quote from Michel Foucault, a quote which has haunted me and to which I have returned again and again ever since I came across it in the fall of 2004. I am not interested in the academic status of what I am doing because my problem is my own transformation. Why should a painter work? if he is not transformed by his own painting. Writing can be so perceived as can so be perceived as part of a practice of the self, a transformation one effects on oneself. It is the conditions of possibility for both this transformation and also this very I which has been cast here upon paper with such a seemingly easy stroke that will be the topic of this book. If there is something like freedom, then I would propose that it might be found in the awareness of the self in the present moment and in its possibilities of becoming, the transrational and transpersonal conditions of which it will be the aim of this book to sketch. In the end, this is also the task of theory, in my opinion. To contribute to a transformation of the self by showing how things could also be different instead of, as Michel Foucault says, legitimating what is already known. The good life will not be realized in theory. In discourse alone, we will not be saved, transformed or reconciled. Yet. In so far as the continuous practice of becoming necessitates effecting a shift in the self, a change of perspective, a certain work performed on oneself, finding out to what extent it is possible to think differently, for me is a crucial step towards a transformative practice and towards opening a door to a different perception. Even if it consists in the recognition of the point in this process at which we have to let go of rational cognition. In a personal vein, my purpose is thus the following, to think until that curious moment at which knowledge has to give way to intuition and understanding, and so to also thinkingly, but not purely thinkingly, trace the path towards that transrational moment in which, through a rebound effect of a certain constellation of knowledge and practice, a transformation of the self can occur. Next in the introduction, state of the art and definition of terms. Before any discussion of the contents can commence, some terms which will be used frequently need clarification as to their meaning in the framework of this study. Since several of those terms have also, also have been the topic of frequent and often heated debates in different academic arenas, it furthermore needs to be asserted at which point one shall enter the discussion. Some of those notions introduced in the following will be reassessed during the course of this work, will be interpreted differently, evolved further, changed or altered. However, in order to do so, a provisional starting point and location within the state of the art needs to be established. Postmodernity. Following Wolfgang Dietrich, 
I shall use the term modernity as designating the societal project characterized by Newtonian physics, Cartesian reductionism, the nation-state of Thomas Hobbes, and the capitalist world system. Dietrich and Suzul, 2006. Philosophically, I did this project to be grounded in a tradition deriving from the ancient Mediterranean area and its origins to be associated with, although not exclusively, with the thoughts of Socrates, Plato and Aristotle. Special focus in this book will be placed on the thinking of Plato, namely on the concept of the truth and the division into a real and an apparent world as it is derived from his Republic. The most famous description of this division between the apparent world of our senses and the real world of concepts, ideas, is of course the Platonic cave allegory as portrayed in the Republic. This venture, however, has to be read against the background of an already existing long tradition of critical encounters with Platonic thought a small part of which will be further elaborated in the following. At the beginning of a line of skeptical thinking towards modernity, as it is of relevance for this book, there stands the work of Friedrich Nietzsche in the second half of the 19th century. It has been pointed out that already Nietzsche's very first book, The Birth of Greek Tragedy, is simultaneously a critique of the culture of his time as well of its ancient foundations. Quote, the birth of tragedy is at once a reinterpretation of ancient Greece, a philosophical and aesthetic revolution, a critique of contemporary culture, and a program to revitalize it. Far from challenging only the philosophical assumptions of Platonic Socratic thought, Nietzsche's critiques also concern the long tradition deriving thereof and ultimately leading into modernity. The division between real and apparent world, truth, objectivity, scientificity, the self-grounded autonomous subject, Descartes' cogito, as well as notions of civilizational progress or the humanistic ideal of enlightenment, so become the target of Nietzsche's vitriolic and dissolving attacks. In the 20th century, this critical line of investigation has been followed up, amongst others, by thinkers such as Martin Heidegger, Wolfgang Schirmacher, Gianni Vatimo, Jean-François Lyotard, Jacques Derrida, Gilles Deleuze, and F Félix Guattari, Michel Foucault, and Jean Baudrillard. This list is by no means exclusive or exhaustive, but points to a certain strand of critical thinking of importance for this book. The field of critical engagements with modernity is far from unified, but reaches out in manifold strands, ranging from the different version of postcolonialism to various waves of feminist critiques and queer and gender studies and peace research. This debate often has circled around the criticism or deconstruction of the metaphysical or metanarrative foundations of modernity. Metaphysics here can be understood as any kind of thinking that is grounded in ultimate foundations or first principles, those principles for, from which all other thinking can derive and which themselves remain beyond questioning. Lyotard renders those first principles as metanarratives from which legitimation for further scientific knowledge originates, but which themselves are not open to proof of rational argument. Lyotard shows how this concern with legitimation via first principles arise with Plato and his cave allegory, 
and continually resurfaces, as for example in Aristotle or in Descartes' Discourse on Method. With Descartes' cogito, the thinking subject is posited as an autonomous and self-grounded high, and so is supposed to provide the stable foundation from which all further argumentation can derive. Lyotard calls this foundation the story of the mind. It is a story, or meta-narrative, because on its own premises it can neither be proven nor refuted. This critique, called postmodern, so concerns itself with making visible and contesting the exclusionary tendencies inherent to metaphysics. Such metaphysical, or in the words of Fatimo, also strong thinking, is seen as ultimately leading to violence. To illustrate this point about violence, Foucault sets out to show how the historical establishment of reason is not the result of an ever more inclusive historical advance of progress, but that reason is, on the contrary, built on the constitution, stigmatizing, and subsequent exclusion of unreason as madness. With the same author, the platonic relation between truth and power and knowledge is inverted. In the Platonic understanding, Foucault asserts, truth and knowledge could be opposed to political power and therefore could work as its court corrective. Well, it does remain possible for Plato to be to pit a powerless truth against the truthless power. Foucault inverts this relation by pointing out that in fact, knowledge and power advance together, and that truth is only ever the result of a specific strategic constellation between them. In the wake of the postmodern critique, concepts like the truth, the autonomous and self-grounded subject, progress, civilization, solvability of conflicts, and even peace have therefore become sites of contestation and debate. Neither of those terms can today be taken for granted anymore, and many pertinent questions from different directions have been raised about what has been excluded through the tradition of thought which builds on them and uses them as if they were pre-given and would remain the ever same, unwavering and unchanging through the times. We can thus grasp the Postmodern, in the words of Lyotard, as incredulity towards meta narratives, a definition from which Wolfgang Dietrich derives the following Postmodernity should not be misunderstood as the historical epoch that follows modernity, although the prefix post might suggest this. However, post also refers to a reflection of something, in this case, of modernity. Therefore, post indicates that the social value system of the time span that it circumscribes refers to a condition which, although preceding it, still has effects and remain relevant at the particular point in time. If this were not the case, the prefix post would be redundant. Postmodernity, then, describes the state of mind of one or several generations that have had to painfully disassociate themselves with the great truths of the previous epoch, without having found for themselves a new unitary system of reference. This state could be described by the word disillusionment. However, regarding the critique of these first principles, it is also becoming increasingly obvious that what has started with Nietzsche's scathing analysis has up until now remained largely a critique that contesting rationality and pointing out its limits and lacunes itself still advanced by rational means. The critique of rationality by rational methods in the end seemed to have come full circle in the recent realization of an increasing disillusionment about disillusionment, or as Batimo refers to it, disenchantment about disenchantment. Quote, 
We are all by now used to the fact that disenchantment has also produced a radical disenchantment with the idea of disenchantment itself. Or in other words, the demythification has finally turned against itself, recognizing that even the ideal of elimination of myth is a myth. At its limit point there today arises the question of whether the postmodern rejection of metaphysics and subsequent disillusionment has proven to be tenable and indeed livable. Frederick Jameson seems to arrive at a very similar question when asking whether the great master narratives which Lyotard deemed to be unsustainable have in fact disappeared or might not much rather merely have gone underground towards a continuing but now unconscious effectivity as a way of thinking about or acting in our current situation. What in consequence can be seen emerging in current discussions? Having taken note of the necessary shortcomings of a critique of rationality itself carried out by rational means, are questions revolving around transrationality and transpersonality. This book and the topics dealt with therein have to be seen as part of this emerging debate, which while still incurred with one foot in postmodern grounds is already reaching out with the other, wondering whether it will dare to put its foot down and where it might land. This step, wherever it finally will land, should in any case not be interpreted as a step forward, a step beyond, or one that perhaps overcomes an obstacle, but much rather as a twisting movement, a verwindung. The current work therefore begins from a postmodern vantage point, taking to heart the incredulity towards meta-narratives. However, by the very token of this incredulity, postmodernity has largely remained a venture of critique. While eating the importance of a postmodern critique, I am so interested in twisting postmodernity towards a practice that is no longer purely critical and rational, but much rather affirmative and transrational. Verwindung, twisting, distortion, fading and weak thinking. The term Verwindung derives from the thinking of Martin Heidegger, and it is here used in Gianni Fatimo's interpretation of Heidegger's thoughts. While being highly critical of the metaphysical tradition and the violence that is inherent to it, Fatimo points out that this tradition still forms part of the historical horizon from which contemporary thinking arises. Fatimo sees the rejection of metaphysics in the light of a truer, more adequate description of reality as impossible. Because such thinking, by the very same token of a categorical rejection, would fall back into the metaphysical categories it tries to criticize. The relation that one can establish with metaphysics is thus not one of overcoming as in a perpetual movement of higher unifications which increasingly become more true, but on the contrary, one that cannot do otherwise than establish a relation of vervindung, one of resigned acceptance of continuation of distortion. Fatimo so contrasts the notion of overcoming Hubervinden with the Heideggerian vervindung while the former carries the connotation of a step towards an increasingly accurate correspondence to the objective truth, the latter, while giving up on the notion of an objectively discernible true world, still accepts metaphysics as part of its heritage to which it resigns itself, but from which it also heals itself. Therefore, while giving the metaphysical heritage a certain space, it is simultaneously twisted and distorted into a new shape. Quote, but since it is not a case of correcting the errors of metaphysics with a more objectively true vision of how things stand, 
the way out of metaphysics is shown to be more complicated. We do not have before us any objectivity that once discovered in what really is could provide a criterion by which to change our thoughts, as though metaphysics might be set aside as an error or a discarded and worn out piece, piece of clothing. This term, Verwendung, preserving also a literal connection with Huberwinden, to overcome, means, however, in practice, to recover from an illness while still bearing its traces, to resign oneself to something. Similarly, Heidegger's English translator Johann Stambo points out that Martin Heidegger's Verwindung is not identical to overcoming in the sense of something that is defeated or left behind, that one has gotten rid of. Verwinden, she asserts, also has the connotation of incorporating, however without the notion of being elevated by such incorporations into a new and progressively higher unities. Verwindung especially in the connotation given to it by Vatimo, so operates in conceptual proximity to the idea of a working through modernity. From such an understanding of Verwindung, Vatimo develops his own concept of weak thinking. Weak is a form of thinking which is aware of its own situatedness and contingency, takes into account the historical background against which and within which it is formed, owning to what Heidegger calls the thrillness of being, and thus, per definition, cannot occur according to a logic of verification and of rigorous demonstration, but only by means of that old, eminently aesthetic instrument called intuition. Weak thinking is impure, for it still contains parts of the strong metaphysical tradition. However, instead of rejecting this tradition, weak thinking embraces, declines, and distorts strong metaphysics. Against the background of the magnificent metaphysical truth, Petimo so states the weakness of the own thought from the very beginning, and thus refrains from building another grand narrative but an even better and more perfected overarching truth. Going beyond Vatimo, this approach enables a positive re-engagement with metaphysics, bewaring its violent tendencies, but integrating and acknowledging it as part of our past and in a twisted form, possibly also future. Both the concepts of weak thinking and Verwindung will recur frequently in this study, and especially the former will be developed further in the following chapters, and in particular as in light of the concepts of transrationality and transpersonality. Third term, rationality and transrationality. As regards to the question of rationality and transrationality, I take the former to be one of the hallmarks of the project of modernity. I understand rationality as the method of proceeding by reason. The term transrational has first been coined by Kent Wilbur, 1999. The prefix trans derives from Latin and signifies across, beyond, through. Walsh, 2002. The transrational thus describes a process which, while also acknowledging reason, transcends it. In a post hegelian interpretation, this might result in the including and sublating transcendence of rationality itself within transrationality, Hofhebung, towards a higher unity. And it is indeed in this sense that Wilbur seems to understand the term. However, in a non-dialectical, weak interpretation, instead of elevating and unifying, the rational is twisted away from the purity of its form, 
the rational soul no longer serves as the proverbial ultima ratio, towards the acknowledgement of fields of experience beyond rationality. The manner in which Apollonian and Dionysian will be related in the course of this book thus gives rise to a transrationality which does not contain them both in a higher unity but is the always precarious and always different relation of two weak principles which are not dialectical but are mutually part of each other and therefore contingent and co-determining. The author means by Apollonian what relates to aesthetic and Dionysian which relates to energetic. The transpersonal. The term transpersonal is also frequently used in this study. It shares with the transrational not just the prefix trans, but also its origin in transpersonal psychology. It derives from the field of transpersonal psychology and has been introduced by one of two pioneers, Abraham Maslow and Stanislav Grof. For use within the psychological field, it has been defined in the following way. Transpersonal, meaning beyond the personal, refers to development beyond conventional, personal or individual levels. More specifically, transpersonal refers to development beyond the average, although such higher functioning turns out to be more common than previously was thought. Transpersonal development is part of a continuum of human functioning or consciousness, ranging from the pre-personal, before the formation of a secret ego, to the personal, with a functioning ego, to the transpersonal, in which an ego remains available but is superseded by more inclusive frames of reference. Scotton, 1996. Transpersonal psychology originated in the 1960s out of the attempts of a group of psychologists and psychiatrists to expand the realm of humanistic psychology beyond its focus on the individual Cartesian subject. In differentiation to the understanding of the transpersonal mentioned above, I will be using the term in a slightly different connotation. What is thus of interest here is not so much a model of the development of the self, as it is proposed, for example, by developmental psychology or Ken Wilber's concept of an expansive and including model of an evolutionary self which goes through successive phases, becoming ever more holistic, more encompassing, integrated and comprehensive. What Wilbur outlines might also be termed an art of the self. However, he describes the hierarchical version of such an art, striving for ever higher forms of realization and implying a developmental telos inherent to all of humanity. For Wilbur, development of the self implies an unfolding through pre-given and describable stages until the self reaches first its mature egoic form, the centaur, and subsequently transcends this form into a higher stages of being, subtle, casual, and non-dual. On each level, the self materializes as an individual form, surface structure, the personal and concrete expression which is shaped and determined by the pre-given, unconscious structural potentials and limitations specific to that level, deep structures. While my project thus shares many common spaces with the work of Wilbur, has indeed the very terms transpersonal and transrational also signify. One crucial difference regards the question of those developmental hierarchies in comparison, my 
art of the self is set against a more open horizon, whose transformations are intuited by the experiencing person and whose necessities are co-derived from the concrete surroundings, without, however, embedding those transformations into an overall frame of universal reference. In simple terms, it might be stated that what will be proposed here is a relational and situational perspective, rather than Wilbert's universalist view which turns the gaze inside the self to find the pre-existing structures which for him always already slumber inside us and thus determine our development. In the present book, the transpersonal will be understood much rather in connection with certain theories of subjectivity and subjectivation, which problematize the idea of a single coherent and stable individual subjectivity, the Cartesian cogito, and dissolve the understanding of an I-U dichotomy. However, without directly recurring to the pre-personal, personal, transpersonal evolutionary model. The question that is thus opened is not so much the psychological question of the evolution and superseding of the ego, but the philosophical and ethical question of an understanding of the self beyond individuality and the distinctive way of life that might ensue from such a conception as well as in general terms of the questions of being and becoming. In summary, the present work is an art of the transpersonal self because it one acknowledges the individual person as one form of experienced existence, yet also two, in tweets larger frames of reference, as for example the notion of an aesthetic energetic sphere, which will be developed throughout this book.